All right, if I could have your attention, we're ready to get started. I have good news and bad news. So let me give you the good news first. The good news is I got an uh, email today from Chairs for Worship, and here's how it reads. I am happy to say your chairs are ready to be shipped. Yeah, let's give the Lord praise. We will be calling you to schedule your delivery after we have payment. Now, we paid half of it. Robert's in the process. He's about halfway through with it, getting the other, other part to him. Uh, I won't read you all the other, but just remember, I want to read this. Just remember you will need volunteers to unload the truck. Truck drivers do not unload, they only drive. We will be sending you delivery instructions when we schedule the delivery. If you have any questions, please give us a call. So, good, that's the good news. The bad news is, Satan is after everybody in this church. Anybody say amen to that? I can tell you right now, Tim woke up this morning about 4 o'clock, our pastor. He was running a high fever. He felt terrible. They took him to the uh, doctor. They did a COVID test. He does not have COVID, but they don't know what it is. So really pray for Tim. Also, Shannon was going today, and I have not heard back from her to know how that trip went to the doctor because of cancer. And we will know more about that. Tim's sister is scheduled for, for kidney cancer the last of this month up in Missouri. I mean, if that doesn't convince you that Satan's after us, her name is Joyce, by the way. His, his sister, Tim's sister. She's visited. She was here about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Uh and I've been praying for her and some others have, but we want to continue to pray. Then Robert, our, uh, one of our elders, our church treasurer, who's working to get some money for our, to, for our chairs, he goes in for a heart cat, heart cat as quickly as they can set this up in Tyler. So he's got his hands full. I talked with Robert this morning. We were kind of dividing up what all we've got to do around here for speaking. And we hung up the phone, and we kind of worked out what we were going to do. And my phone rang, and it was my nephew. My brother is in the hospital in Dallas. He went in for gallbladder, and now his pancreas has quit working. So our three teaching Pastors and elders, we've been attacked. Did you say amen? So at the end of the service, I'm going to try to make this quick as I can. Well, I say that. You all know I'm a Baptist, so it'll be when we get through. But I'm going to try to make it quick and allow some time. I want to break up into several groups and pray for each of the individuals that I've, I've mentioned and I'll give you the instructions on how we're going to do that. Other than that, things are wonderful. Jesus is still on the throne. That's called sandwich psychology, in case you haven't heard. You, you, have, you have good news, bad news, good news, and you sandwich it all together, and it's not half as bad. I, Robert said, Robert's been teaching our Bible studies this week, and bless his heart, he's had his hands full and he said, I don't think I can do the Bible study and all the other stuff I've got to do and teach tonight. I said, I happen to have something I prepared about three weeks ago. I think you'll like it. As we go through it, you'll probably say, what in the world does this have to do with us? But wait till the end, all right? I want you to, tonight, we're going to open our Bibles uh, to Numbers chapter 15. Numbers 15. They're going to put the screen up again. Verse 37 begins. 
I'll give you a chance to turn there. You might want to follow in your own Bible. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And ye shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, and that ye may not follow the harlotry to which your own hearts and your own eyes are inclined. And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God and I am the I am the Lord, your God. You say, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Back then, you'll have to remember, Genesis had not been written, Exodus had not been written, Numbers had not been written, Deuteronomy had not been written. There was no word of God in any written form except the commandments that God gave on Sinai. At, the, at Sinai, God said, appoint the men as scribes, and they'll make copies of all the rules that I have, and you can pass them out, and you can... But nobody had the word of God. Nobody. Gutenberg not, had not come along. There was no printing press. Joshua, Judges, Numbers, I mean, uh, uh, First and Second Samuel... That was all future. The New Testament was unheard of. And the fact that Jesus would come is not something that any of them could conceive, conceive of. So God said, I want you to make these garments. And I want you to put tassels on them. And I want them to be a reminder to you of what I have told you to do. If you've seen old pictures of the New Testament, the Old Testament, you've probably seen some men who wore something very similar to this right here. It's called a tallit. And I'll share this with you, some more with you later about this. The tassels all represent, there were 613 tassels and pieces of strings on this prayer shawl or tallit. Each one of them was to remind the, us that God is Lord. The first one was, Jehovah is God and there is no other. They did not have the written word, but they had a, a visual simulation that would teach them what they needed to know about God's word. Maybe some of us ought to get us a prayer shawl. Might help us remember some of the things. That they had going. It we're reminded again in Deuteronomy. And I probably won't read that one. But we'll. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, 12, God, uh God tells them again. I want you to remember. And make these garments with fringe. On the, on the corners. I was blessed in my life. I. Did not know anything about a prayer shawl or what it was supposed to be. And in the early 2000s, I started a little ministry to the lame, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. These are people who were sick, dying, homeless. These were people who had diseases of which there was, was no cure. And we reached out to this group of people and tried to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ and that God loves them and God cares for them. And they could, they could experience that love if they'd only accept Jesus. During that time, there was a, a man and wife from Lufkin, Texas, who got a hold of us. They had heard through the grapevine, don't ask me how, because we did not advertise and did not even have a sign in front of the church. 
They said, we understand that you help six people. And we said, yeah, we do. We try to. He came into my building on a Wednesday night with one of these around his shoulders. He was a Messianic Jew. Anybody know what a Messianic Jew is? That's a Jew who has accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. They have received him as Savior, and they are now trying to convert other Jews to the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ. He said to me, he said through our service, at the end he said, I have cancer, and I'm dying. I come to Dallas about once every two weeks and stay for a week while I get my treatments, and then I go back home. He said, the weeks that I am in Dallas, is there any way, first of all, would you let us come to your services? And I said, absolutely. He said, is there any way that you have any parking here where we could pull our RV up and stay in it so that we don't have a lot of expenses? Well, it turned out that the warehouse building that we were renting had sewer connections and water connections and electrical connections, and we said, just pull it right back here. I learned a lot about Messianic Jews at that time. They shared with my people and, and, and anybody who would listen how that, how, what God was doing for the Jewish people who had believed in the Messiah. And we talked, and I asked him what this was, and he said, it's a talit. Well, I had no idea what that was, and so I said, tell me about the talit. He took me to the scriptures that we just read, and he shared them with me, and we began to look at them. After we broke up that night, I got my dictionary out, and my concordance, and everything else, and I said, talit. Talit means a little tent. Now, this is going to be important later. A little tent. Now, the Jews at that time, coming out of the land of, of Egypt, they had a big tent that they were in the process of building. It was called the tabernacle. But not everyone could go in the tabernacle. There was the inner court where only the priests could go. There was the holy place where only the priests could go. And there was the holy of holies where only the high priest could go. Everybody else stood outside. How would you like to go to a service like that? No seats, no chairs. Send back and say thank you that we got chairs on the way. Uh, we can sit down. And, and so they stood. And sometimes they stood for hours while, the Bible, while, while God was giving. They were reading the law to each other. As they did that, they could not go in and pray because they were not priests. Part of this was that God wanted them to have a little tent for when he dealt with them that they could put on <coughs> and have solitude from the people around him. This went on for many years. Let's look at uh, uh, Deuteronomy 6-7. God said to the children of Israel, you shall teach them, what? The laws. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. I always thought as I was growing up and as I was raising my kids that that meant... I was supposed to be teaching as we drove around in our car and all that. But the Jews had me beat there. They all wore a tallit. The tallit, as they walked with their children, they could say, this fringe says that there is one God and his name is Jehovah. This says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This one says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. This one says, Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. 
This one says, Thou shalt not envy your neighbor. And they begin to, to teach their children. They do not have the written word. They were, they were blessed to have a way of teaching their children as they walked along the way, as they sat in their house, as they lay down at night, they could teach their children about this. And you say, well, this is all well and good and wonderful, but we're not Jews. Well, I'll get to that later. In the Bible, God reminds us in several different places that this, he, he did in the scripture we read and in uh, Deuteronomy that we did not read, he reminds them of three things that the Talit was to teach them. Number one, it was to teach them who God is. Well, we could use a dose of that nowadays, amen. Uh, second of all, it was to remind Israel of who they were. I think we could use some of that today too. And thirdly, it was to represent spiritual authority. And God said, all of your teachers should have this. Every head of every home should have a, have a talit. Everybody that is anybody that has any authority over anything should have a talit so that they could teach with authority. I remind you that when David was fleeing from uh, Saul and he went to the, uh, Saul was after him and, and had chased him down, he thought, and Saul went into a cave. And in that cave, he did not know it. His secret service didn't do a very good job. David and his men were hiding. And so Saul sits down and has a cool drink of water and was fanning himself because it was probably a day like this that we had today. And he was hot and bothered. And David saw him there, and David's first impulse was to take a knife and kill him. But he said, that's God's anointed, and I won't do that. And so David took a knife and cut off the hem of the garment of Saul. Do you know what he cut off? He cut the tassels off of Saul's talit. Because Saul was king. He, he was a man in authority. He would have had one of these on. David later repented of that and said, I should not be the one to... Try to take your authority. So I'm going to. I, I'm going to apologize to you. And it caused a reuniting of David and, and Saul for a while. And that's good. This represented authority. Now by the time. Anything that man has anything to do with. Degenerates. Could somebody say amen to that? What starts off good. Has a tendency to go down. It's true in church, it's true in government, it's true in business, it's true everywhere we look, it starts off great, but then the more that man has to do with it, the sadder it becomes. By the time that Jesus came into this world, we're going we're gonna to skip the rest of the Old Testament, there are other examples, but we're just going to, I'm trying to hurry. In the New Testament, when Jesus came into this world, all of the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, all wore one of these. If you see old pictures around of, of happenings in the New Testament, you'll notice that all of them have on a tallit because it was their symbol of authority. They had forgotten it was supposed to represent uh, God and it was supposed to remind them of who God was. They had forgotten it was supposed to remind them of who they were and they created a religion around that. Now, when Jesus came along, one of the first things he did was teach about prayer. Matthew 6, 6 through 8. What was happening is these people go to pray. They were wearing their biggest, finest, nicest. The bigger the tallit you had the more power you had. That sounds like a bunch of men, right? And uh, I'll leave it at that. And, and, and so they wanted to show off. 
They would stand on the street corner when they prayed, and they'd hire somebody to... Da, da, da. And then they'd do their teaching and praying for everybody to hear. When they gave their alms, they did the same thing. Somebody following them around, da, 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 and they dropped their offering. Jesus says here in Matthew, but when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, wait a minute. Most of the houses back then only had one room. Any of y'all know what I'm talking about? I grew up in houses where sometimes there was only one room. When you pray, go in, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in a secret place. Did I lose my PA microphone here? No, I guess not. It feels like it, so y'all pray for me. I'm not technologically savvy, so sometimes I have to check things out. Shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Next. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition. That's just words to be saying words. Do you all ever know any about people that do did that in church? It, what, that all the times I pastored, I always had somebody in the church that when the ladies signaled me dinner on the grounds was not quite ready and that we need, they needed another five or ten minutes, there was always two or three people that I would say, Brother so-and-so, would you lead us in prayer for our meal today? Because I knew they would pray around the world and back. They would bless every missionary. They would say everything that needed to be said. And the vain repetitions would follow. Gerald, you ever had that too? You know what I'm talking about? But, but here, here you've got to... He says, don't use these vain repetitions. That's what the heathen do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Where did we ever get the idea that our prayer time should be the computer printout list that covers a city block of all the things we need? Do you not realize that your prayer time is supposed to be time with you talking to Him and Him talking to you? I mean, the truth of the matter is, I don't have to tell God what He needs to do. He already knows. He's a lot smarter than I am. I don't have to explain how He needs to work it out. I just need to get out of His way and say, Father, I'm here. I'll tell you what happens in my life. Years ago, I used to pray that God would touch Joanna's heart. That, that was, there was needs in her life that I felt she needed. Anybody, anybody ever prayed like that? And, and I would pray, Lord, would you just touch Joanna? Would you show her this? Would you show her that? Would you help her understand? And finally, the Holy Spirit got tired of it one day and said, Hush. She's not here. I don't speak behind somebody's back, and we're not going to talk about her. But you're here. So let's talk about you. Truth of the matter is, our prayers ought to be about how our relationship with our Father is. It ought to be, Lord, what do I need to know? What do I need to ask? What do I need in my life? So he says, your father knows what you have need of before you ask. In Matthew uh, 23, 5, he even condemns these guys. He says, but all their works, they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. 
The CEV translation reads it like this, and it's a whole lot easier to understand. Everything they do is to show off in front of others. They even make a big show of wearing scripture verses on their foreheads and arms, and they wear big tassels for everyone to see. Jesus said, you don't need that. You don't need to talk long, loud. You don't need to wear a lot of garments. You just need to rely and talk to me. As we move further into the New Testament, we, we come to the book of Mark, chapter 5, beginning in verse 25 through 34. The story of a lady in the Bible who was very sick. She had an issue of blood and she was sick for a long, long time. Oh, I'll have to read it because I, I evidently gave the wrong scripture. Mark 5, so we, we got the wrong one. Let's just all turn there and read it together then. How about that? That was my fault. I did not know till this morning I'd be teaching tonight. And I gave my note, uh, notes to Mike, and he tried to put them in. And anybody who's ever tried to read my writing knows that that's an impossibility to uh, cipher what I write down. Mark chapter 5. Beginning in 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Now the first thing I, that comes to my mind when I read that is that any woman who had a bloody discharge was considered unclean during the time of her bloody discharge. And because of that, she was not allowed to come in contact with any pious believers. So here's this woman. She's sick. Here's what it says in verse 26. And had suffered many things from many physicians. Could somebody say, man, you've been to the doctor lately? Sometimes they tell us things we don't want to know. And sometimes they don't tell us... The whole truth and nothing but the truth. They say amen to that. And she spent all that she had and was no better, but grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I will be made well. And immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt, in, felt it in her body and she was healed of the affliction. <coughs> and Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power, in another, another version it says virtue had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? <laughs> Notice what the disciples said. You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? That's got to be Peter that said that. I mean, Peter's that guy that I identify with, always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. What do you mean, who touched you? <coughs> Have you looked at this crowd? There must be a thousand people around us. They're all trying to get up here to touch you. What do you mean, who touched you? But he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Hey, listen, when you're dealing with Jesus, you better tell him the whole truth because he already knows it anyway. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. You know what she touched?
She touched the prayer shawl that Jesus wore. She probably touched, touched the one that said, There is one God, and his name is Jehovah. She was healed. We read in the rest of that chapter, and I'm not going to go there because I'm wanting to hurry to get us out of here. In the rest of that chapter, in the next chapter, people, people came just so they could get close and touch the hem of his garment. This right here. And in case you don't know it, Jesus wore one of these. That's why people called him rabbi, master, teacher, because he wore a prayer shawl. Now I'm going to take you to John chapter 20. Yeah. I was hoping we got that one right. It's the morning of the third day. And one of the women have been at the tomb. And she sees there's no one in the tomb. And she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple who Jesus loved, that's John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the, to the tomb first. And he, Peter, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there. The next verse is the one I want you to get. And the handkerchief. that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. This is so important. You realize this is what convinced Peter that Jesus had arose. This was the covering that covered Jesus' face. He came in and he saw that it was folded a certain way. It was set by the side. For three and a half years, Jesus and Peter and the other disciples had been together. They'd been with him at night. They'd been with him when he had prayed half the night or when he slept. Came together and there was a certain way that he folded his, arm, his prayer shawl. It was a certain way that he did. I have no idea how it was. Maybe he folded it like a flag. Maybe he folded square. Maybe he folded it in a triangle. I don't know. But Peter looked at it, and it was all folded together by itself. And it convinced Peter that he'd done this himself. This wasn't what a grave robber did. This is what Jesus did, and it convinced him when he saw it. We read this in other places. We won't go there, but John chapter 11, when Lazarus comes forth, they, they, ha they have to remove the, the cloth from his face. In Acts chapter 9, there's a woman there, and I, will, I won't read the whole thing to you, but her name was Dorcas, and she, she passed away. You remember the story? Dorcas was a great Christian lady who did things. She made clothes. She made garments. She made tunics for all the disciples. Now remember, this is before Cornelius has come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So all the believers were Jewish believers. Anybody with me on this? If you come to the, come to the men's Bible study on Monday, we're, we're just past that. What she was making for these Jewish believers was prayer shawls. So at this time, they were still using them. 
You say, Roy, this is all well and good. I appreciate all this. Should we be wearing a prayer shawl today? No. What does it mean for us? Well, there's coming a day soon in Revelations. We're going to come back to this earth. And we're going to come back with a king who's wearing a prayer shawl. Jesus is not coming back to be the pastor of First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. For any of you that are interested, it's not going to happen. What, he's not coming back to establish a megachurch that's worldwide. He's not even coming back to establish a church. He's coming back to the Jewish people. That's what, uh, let's go, yeah. John writes and said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And him that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judged, judges and makes war. And his eyes were like flames of fire. And his head, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew except himself. This is Jesus, by the way. He's on a white horse. He's going to tell us more about that later. And he had all these crowns on his head. Now, how, why did Jesus have all these crowns on his head? Because an event had to already taken place in heaven that we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, I'm not sure that Jesus is not Baptist because the first thing we're going to do when we get to heaven is have a big supper and a feast. So maybe he is, you know. I, I can tell you, though, that my Jewish friends, Jewish Christian friends, tell me that in the Old Testament, everything was a cause for celebration and eating. They say everything, a party, whatever it is, it's cause for a party. But Jesus is coming back. And he was clothed in, with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Next one. And the armies in heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That's us. That's us. Years ago, when I pastored, started a little ministry in Rowlett, Texas, there was a lady that I had known from First Baptist Saxe who developed cancer, and the, the pastors that followed myself and, and Jim Everidge were not real sympathetic to this lady. She was dying of cancer. They didn't check on her. They didn't. And so she called me one day, and she said, I'm in the hospital in Carrollton, Texas, would you come and visit me? I said, sure. So I jumped in my old pickup truck, and I went flying across Dallas and got to, uh, uh, I believe it was Trinity Hospital on, uh, in Carrollton. She gave me her room number, and I went up to that room, and she was in there, and she began to explain to me that she knew she was going to die. She had talked to God about it, she was at peace with it. But she said, I want somebody that knows me to preach my funeral. And she said, the only preachers I know that well are you guys, Jim Everidge and myself. Jim was in evangelism at that time, was gone all the time. And she said, don't know when I'm going to die, but would you preach my funeral? I said, yes. Visited with her and she said, I'm wanting to go home because I, I know I only have a few days left. She said, I've got to ask you a question. Are there going to be horses in heaven? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I know the answer to that one. And we went here and we read together that we're going to be on white horses. She loved horses and she raised horses. She said, I'm so glad you told me that, Brother Roy. She said, do you ride? I said, some. 
does Joanna ride? And I said, not at all. She said, tell you what I'm going to do. I know I've only got a few days to live. But when I get there, I'm going to volunteer to get the horses ready for the second coming. And she said, I'm going to pick out one of the best for you. She went home that weekend and Monday morning, the funeral home called me said she's passed away. I'd ask her, Carolyn, what do you want me to say at your funeral? She said, just tell them about Jesus. And so at her funeral, I told them about Jesus. When I got to the end, I said, how many of you here today don't know Jesus or would like to receive him as your Lord and Savior? 24 people held up their hand. I prayed a prayer and they repeated it after me. The best of my knowledge, those people, I'm going to see up there. Here's the next part I want to show you. Go to the next verse. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God. Next. And he had on a robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I used to think Jesus is going to have a tattoo. Anybody out there? It says his name's going to be written on his thigh. As I learned about from the Jewish Messianic Jews, they had already figured this out. They said he's going to have on. A tallit. What's going to be laying on his thigh? There is one God. And his name is Jehovah. And he and I are one. King of kings and Lord of lords. You say, well, what does all that mean for me? I taught this to you today so I could remind you of the three things that God gave it originally for so that they could be taught who God is and reminded of whose they are and to represent authority, spiritual authority. We know who he is. Anybody want to have, have a screaming church fit, run up and down the aisles and shout, Jesus is Lord? Anybody, anybody really looked at themselves lately and said, I'm the son of a king. I am the son of God. I am joint heir with Jesus Christ. I am seated in heavenly places in him. Tim's been teaching you about this. I am everything this book says I am. I can do everything this book says I can do. And I have the authority to do anything God wants me to do. Are you out there? We have spiritual authority. I want to end the service tonight with this thought. Half our elders are sick. The other half are going through hell right now. Could you say amen to that? Number one, I'm reminded of who my God is. He can fix 
and do anything. Could I get a testimony on that? Yeah. I'm reminded of who I am. Down here, the day I die, they won't lock up Walmart and close the shopping centers down. It'll be another day to make money. And they'll preach my funeral and I'll be gone. But you know what? Heaven will open. I'll see Robert up there. Heaven will open and a angels will come like they did the beggar and carry me to heaven. I'm somebody. I'm somebody. Not in this world. Business world didn't know who I am. I've owned some businesses. Nobody cares who I am. I'm not important enough. I don't produce enough money. I'm not, I'm not capable of kicking into their little game, whatever they're playing. Could you say amen to that? But what they don't know is that I have spiritual authority. I know the king that sits on the throne. And he's my brother Jesus. And he has raised the dead. He has cured the sick. He's opened blinded eyes. He stopped the funeral. Raised the boy from the dead. I want to tell you. The same authority he has. I have. So I want us to stop for just a minute. I've asked some folks to help me with this. I want us to divide into groups. Well, when you hear the whole, what I want you to do. Robert Haley's facing this heart cat. Robert Ward is going to lead the prayer of the group that goes around him. Robert's going to word the prayer. The rest of you pray silently because we don't keep you here all night. It's too hot. It's probably not as hot out there as it is up here. But it's plenty hot up here. I told you about my brother today. Taylor is going to lead the group that prays for me. I told you about Joyce, Tim's sister. Ann Felling is going to word the prayer for that group. I'd like, I'd like for that to be ladies that pray for her. Joanna needs some ladies to come with her. Y'all are going to pray for Shannon. Mike, my son, this affects me because my son is my heart. He's looking for a job, and just the time he starts looking, business dries up. There is no more capital. Things are going down. He thought he had a, a job lined up. It didn't work out. Hey, I believe that God's got something for him better than all that, and Dalen is going to go back and word the prayer for Mike. For Tim, some of you men come around Greg Felling. Greg's going to pray for our pastor, Tim. You say, why did you pick those guys? Because as I thought about it today, this is who God laid on my heart for each of these prayer groups. I personally believe that we need to tell Satan to get out of our life. I think for Ann, uh, 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 for Joyce, we need to say, Satan, get thee hence. For it is written, you're a child of God. We got the authority to do that. Did you know that? I think for Tim, we say, get thee hence, Satan. This is our pastor. This is the man we love and follow. Get thee hence, Satan. Get out of here. We don't need you. For my son, Mike, we say, 
We don't need your interfering, Satan. Get thee hence. For Shannon, we just need to tell them, get thee hence, Satan. We don't need you anymore. For Robert, we just need to tell them, Satan, get gone, man. We don't need you around anymore. Taylor's going to pray for me, and I've already been telling Satan all day long, get thee hence, Satan. I personally believe we have seen the power of God work before. Some of you remember when Tim was in the hospital and they couldn't figure out what it was. He had all kinds of infections and they said his kidneys might be failing. We broke up into groups and we prayed and what happened? He came home in like three days. Satan is after this church. Let me give you good news. And, and I'm not trying to just keep you here. We have averaged in June, except for the Memorial Day weekend, we have averaged about 200 a Sunday. Somebody say amen to that. This is the middle of summer. Air condition is not working right. And what do we have? 200 on Sunday morning. Get the end, Satan. We got things going on. God's blessing. Why is he after Robert? Why is he after me? Why is he after Tim? Because we're elders. We're trying to do what's right. He's after these other elders too, believe me. He wants to stop us right where we are. So right now, you've decided who you're going to pray for and you know who it is. Go to them and uh, just form little groups. Greg, why don't I get you up here and that way you can be over here somewhere praying for Tim and the ladies can get around to him. Thank you, my brother. You know, for me that's hard because I think I'm the only one that's not worthy of God's love. But he loves me anyway. <laughs>